And now to the proposal by former Supreme Court Ju Justice John Paul Stevens to repeal the Second Amendment. That could be a tough sales job because the Constitution makes it that way. As Eric Ham reported earlier, Stevens' op-ed in the New York Times was a history lesson, pointing out that it wasn't until a 2008 Supreme Court decision that there was an individual right to bear arms. He wrote the ruling granted the NRA a, quote, propaganda weapon of immense power. David Heller, deputy director of the Media Law Resource Center, is here to talk about the proposal. It's a pretty bold proposition to say, let's get rid of the Second Amendment. It's a very bold and very principled uh, position to take. Um, it's consistent with his ruling in the Supreme Court case that considered 10 years ago whether uh, private ownership of guns for self-defense was constitutional or not. Um, and you don't have to do anything else but click on the comment section to his op-ed. Uh, there were a thousand when I looked at it this afternoon. There are probably 2,000 by now to see how divided uh, the proposition is and how re reflect how divided the country is. I mean, changing the Constitution is hard. It was deliberately made so. It takes uh, the two-thirds of both houses of Congress just to propose the amendment and then has to be ratified by three-quarters of the states. Um, and it, uh, it is a principled uh, solution to the problem, but it's one that would really face uh, you know, great opposition, I think, in, go, in, in trying to enact. And certainly not possible in the current environment. Um, it doesn't seem so. Um, on the other hand, the March for Our Lives uh, rallies that have occurred around the country have been extremely moving and poignant. Uh, they've highlighted, you know, the terrible problem with the mass shootings that have occurred. So there certainly does seem to be a popular uh, uh, yearning for some solution to the gun violence problem. I want to go back to that Hel to the Heller decision, um, the 2008 decision, and talk about what the, what the Supreme Court understanding of the Second Amendment was prior to that decision. I mean, it's hard to say. The Heller decision, as I understand it, was really the first decision to tackle head-on this question that gun rights activists have uh, asserted, which is that the Constitution gives people a right to gun ownership for self-defense. I think in the years prior to that, uh, most people thought that it meant a regulated militia. Those and are not the words that are in the amendment. That's correct. Um, I think if you look at the Heller decision, though, Judge Scalia, Justice Scalia, who wrote the main opinion, though at the same time as recognizing a right also said that like other rights it can be balanced uh, with other considerations, public safety. I mean obviously people are not entitled to have machine guns in their homes and I think the court left it a little bit for states to figure out what those sensible regulations should be. The problem is if you have a divided country it becomes hard to move forward on those legislative solutions on sensible regulation and you, and you get into the gridlock that we have. And there's also, of course, you have a very powerful and very wealthy lobbying organization in the NRA, which has taken that 2008 decision and really pushed it forward. Yeah, no, I, the NRA, it's a powerful organization. It reflects, I think, the, uh, the history of gun ownership in this country. Uh, they have their position that it's a fundamental right and they have uh, you know, a, a, a good number of followers for that position. Um, and they, like other groups, try to exert political influence in you know, every two years in congressional elections. And a lot of people are responsive. A lot of, people, a lot of legislators agree with their position. And, and we end up in the position that we're in, hard to enact new legislation. Is it possible that going forward what we will see, if it not a unified federal national approach, we will see states taking action? I, I think so. I mean, I think we'll see in response to these rallies around the country, efforts by states to start enacting what they see as sensible gun regulations. What individual populations will support. That's right. And then you'll see, I mean, those uh, gun rights groups will obviously try to test those in the court and we'll see what uh, ultimately courts decide. But I do think it will be through the states that we'll get some movement forward and, and it will test what the parameters are for gun rights versus gun and public safety. 
One, one more question on this. Um, we've heard from these young people, the March for Our Lives um, people, saying, you know, I've got 11-year-old girls, seven more years until I can vote, three more years until I can vote. I can vote next November. Um, is that, do you think that there is a possibility here that we may have a generation who, like gun supporters and NRA supporters, will become largely single-issue voters and vote on the question of gun control? I, I think it's possible. Um, some of these issues, of course, might end up being driven by what happened, by, by events. And if there are more uh, mass shootings like this, that will obviously drive public uh, perception in certain ways. Uh, but I do think it is, uh, it is in the balance right now, whether this is just a moment or a movement. Mm -hmm. And I do think that young people uh, as have been energized around the country, certainly to maybe consider this issue for the first time and see the importance to them and, and safety in their communities. David Heller is the Deputy Director of the Media Law Resource Center. So stay with us. We'll be coming back to you to discuss why the President has not said a word or even tweeted about Storm, Stormy Daniels. An uncharacteristic silence from the President two days after 60 Minutes broadcast that interview with porn star Stormy Daniels, who says she had an affair with him in 2006. And Donald Trump has yet to say or tweet a word in public. Meanwhile, legal pressure on him and his lawyer grows. Back with me again is David Heller, Deputy Director of the Media Law Resource Center. So, Stormy Daniels um, is now suing Michael Cohen, who is one of Donald Trump's lawyers, for defamation. Uh, does she have a case? Um, she may. Um, the issue is an interesting one. Ordinarily, people disagree all the time. We might disagree over what we discuss on this program. It doesn't necessarily mean it should lend itself uh, to a libel suit. But there have been some cases recently uh, where courts have considered the question about denials of sexual assault allegations. Um, we had that a few years ago, starting in the Bill Cosby case. And I think in that climate and in the climate of the Me Too movement, courts will look with particular sensitivity and will give such cases, the one that Stormy Daniels is bringing against Michael Cohn and, and things related to that, a, a little bit more consideration than they might have in the past and certainly more consideration than ordinary disagreements between people because not everything that we might disagree about should be considered to be lying and untrustworthiness between each other. But that's really the heart of where this case lies and whether uh, Trump's lawyer is in effect calling her a deceitful liar out to get him. What's the jeopardy for the president in this? Well, if you recall from 20 some years ago, Bill Clinton was involved in a civil lawsuit and his alleged and uh, perjury in that case led to his impeachment. So the same questions would arise for Trump. If the case with Stormy Daniels goes forward and he's called to be a fact witness in it, um, it he would have to testify truthfully. If not, he would risk the same uh, perjury jeopardy that President Clinton found himself into. So this uncharacteristic silence from the president, um, he, you know, we have two investigations going forward. We have the Mueller investigation related to Russia, and we have this Per, more personal investigation and perhaps others associated with that as well. On the Mueller investigation, it seems that there's no hesitation on the part of the president to fire, fire off tweets, to make remarks, even though we are told that his lawyers have shared their wish with him that he would not. Why do you think he's being more disciplined in this instance? Well, I think in the Mueller investigation, it's certainly possible that he's trying to shape public perception about the investigation and the jeopardy that it might bring him into. Um, his silence in uh, regard to the Stormy Daniels case, I, I think it's a matter of speculation. I mean, one uh, consideration might just be exactly what we talked about, the potential for a libel suit. Um, if he calls her a liar, uh, maybe he'll be added directly as a defendant in the case. He's actually already being sued by a former uh, apprentice contestant in yes. New York State uh, for exactly that scenario. She made um, allegations about his behavior, sexual misconduct in his, in, in his dealings with her. He denied it. He called her in, in multiple times uh, you know, a liar and a fabricator. And it was all, all concocted. 
and her lawsuit just survived a motion to dismiss. The court said, no, this is a case that can go forward. Uh, what he said about her, it, it, on its face, it, it is a factual and hurtful uh, allegation against her, and, and the court should let it go forward and, and see where it goes. We actually have got some sound from the uh, press secretary's briefing this afternoon at the White House where she was asked, as you would think she might be, um, exactly what she and the president had said to each other about um, this particular interview in Stormy Daniels. So let's take a, take a quick listen to that. Have you sat down with the president to talk about Stormy Daniels? What has he told you that he wants us to know about? Uh, as I just said, and I, as we've addressed on a number of times, the president has denied these allegations, uh, and I don't have anything else further to add on that. I've called him a counterpuncher many times. Why is he not punched back on this one? <laughs> Uh, look, the president, I didn't say he punches back on every single topic. If he did, uh, he would probably be addressing a lot of the stories that most of you write every single minute of every single day. He also has a country to run. So the president there saying, or Sarah Huckabee Sanders on behalf of the president there saying that, yes, of course, he denies these allegations. And then the question, why doesn't he punch back? And the answer is, well, if he punched back on this, he'd be punching back all the time on all these crazy stories that all you reporters keep on coming up with. Um, it does It does sort of, um, it, it, it does suggest that there is concern in the, in the White House about this. Uh, I mean, it, it certainly could. He has not been shy about taking his so-called war against the press uh, public over and over and, and tweeting when he disagrees uh, with what has been published about him. So it, it certainly suggests that this is something that he or his lawyers recognize some danger and he's being uncharacteristically circumspect. I want to ask you about the non-disclosure agreement that they had um, Stephanie Clifford, Stormy Daniels sign um, just days yeah. before the 2016 election. And there was a line in that agreement for Donald Trump as De Dennis Dennison to sign. Um, and it, apparently it wasn't. Does that render that non-disclosure agreement null and void? Or does it just sloppy work? Is it... What does um, that say to you? Not necessarily. I mean, to be honest, though, this is really uncharted territory for American presidents. We haven't had experience with presidents with non-disclosure agreements with Playboy models and uh, porn stars. But I think in general, uh, non-disclosure agreements can be enforceable. I mean, in this case, uh, you know, the facts are that money was uh, exchanged for silence or with efforts to use a story, perhaps at some time in the future. Those type of rights can be contracted away. It's just very unusual to, to have that involving the American president and having not just two women that we know about, but uh, well, three women, if you include The Apprentice. Three women, but, but perhaps more non-disclosure agreements out there with other women that we don't know about. Wow. David Heller, Deputy Director of the Media Law Resource Center, thanks so much.